Please continue to enjoy your lunch, and good afternoon. My name is Gaddy Vasquez, and I am a proud member of the Board of Directors of the Public Policy Institute of California. And on behalf of the board members, uh, we are pleased to present this program today featuring speaker and our guest, uh, Secretary Leon Panetta. Thank you, Secretary Panetta, for joining us today. This event is part of PPIC's 2020 speaker series on California's future. We would like to thank the sponsors of this series for their underwriting support. These organizations are listed on the screens in the room and on the back of your program. The series is funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle. These are groups of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to the Public Policy Institute of California. We invite you to please consider joining us as a sponsor or donor so that we can continue to make programs like this one possible and ensure that, best of all, they are free and open to the public in person and online. More information is available at your table. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items which are always inevitable at these kinds of gatherings. We're always trying to improve our events, and so we would ask you today, uh, after you receive an email from us, we'll include a short survey. And we would ask that you please take a few minutes to, or moments, to let us know how we did, because your feedback is valuable and important <clears throat> to the Institute. And please, please, please silence your cell phones. Now onto the program, and I am pleased to introduce the moderator of today's conversation, the President of the Public Policy Institute of California and the Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Mark Baldessari. Mark. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Gaddy. Thank you for being on our Board of Directors. We have a number of our other members of our Board of Directors here today. I just want to acknowledge them. Um, Steve Merksimer, who's our Board Chair. Um, Helen Iris Torres, who's on our Board of Directors. Karen, Karen Skelton. Uh, Phil Eisenberg, um, and our former board member, Gary Hart, is here today, too. So, very nice. Um, we're very fortunate to be talking to Secretary Leon Panetta, especially given all that's going on recently, and I want to make the most of this time with Secretary Panetta today. He's made so many tough decisions in leadership positions for decades during some of the most consequential moments in American history. And it seems like we're having another one of those consequential moments in American history now. If you have a question for Secretary Panetta, please write on one of the cards in, that you'll find in the middle of your table with pens and hold it up and a member of our PPIC staff will, will collect them shortly. Um, I'll, I also have some questions which have already been submitted by our audience. We'll, we'll hope to get to those as well. It's now my pleasure to welcome you, Leon. And thank you for joining us on another slow news day. And <laughs> I'm going to start by asking you to put on your CIA director hat and analyze the intelligence for us. I'd like to talk about the situation in Iran. You were in the room when the decision was made to bring Osama bin Laden to justice. And as CIA director at the time, you were a key member of President Obama's leadership team. Help us to understand both the differences and similarities between the US military raid on bin Laden in Pakistan in 2011 and the recent US drone strike on Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. Well, uh, before I dive into that one, uh, let, me, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me first of all uh, say how uh, glad I am to be here uh, with Mark and PPIC, and uh, I'm, I'm a member of the board of PPIC, and I, I really do think that this institute is critical to the ability to look at the issues that impact on California now and in the future. And so I thank you, Mark, for your leadership and all the board members for their leadership as well. I also told uh, Mark when I found out that we would be up here while you're all having lunch. <laughs> I said, well, 
I guess it's okay because Italians are used to talking while people are eating. That's right. Yeah. So I'm glad That's to right. be here yeah. for that reason. Uh, the, uh, the Bin Laden raid was based on going after someone who had targeted and conducted the 9-11 attack on the United States. Uh, and as a consequence of, of doing that, he and other leaders in Al-Qaeda uh, were put on uh, a list uh, to be targeted because even though we had driven into Afghanistan and forced the leadership to the mountains of, uh, of Pakistan, the tribal areas of Pakistan, uh, it was pretty clear from all the intelligence that we were getting that they were continuing to plan additional attacks on the United States of America. And so for that reason, uh, they were put on our targeted list. And when we were able to get intelligence on his location, uh, with the president's approval, we conducted uh, the raid that got bin Laden. The, at, I've been asked the question, did we ever look at Soleimani? Uh, and the reality is no, we never seriously considered an attack on Soleimani because it was apparent what the consequences would be uh, and that the result would be that we would increase the risk of war with Iran if we did it. Uh, it's not to say that Soleimani uh, is not a bad actor. He is a bad actor. Uh, and he's been involved leading the Quds Force. He's been involved in obviously organizing all of the proxy forces, the militias uh, that the Quds Force uses, not only in the Middle East, but around the world. Uh, and the result has been uh, you know, thousands of lives that uh, have been lost, and also hundreds of U.S. military lives that were lost uh, as a result as well. What, what concerned me is the issue of timing uh, and how it played out in a very tense situation with Iran. Because we were clearly in a punch and counterpunch approach at that point. Uh, you know, the Iranians were trying to hit uh, people uh, in, uh, at U.S. bases going after ships, etc. And then when they attacked uh, a base in uh, Iraq, killing an American, uh, that uh, created a counterattack by the United States. Uh, we hit, uh, used a missile attack to go after uh, one of their militias. Uh, they then went after our embassy in Iraq. And it was clear at the time that things were escalating. And that you know this punch and counterpunch approach uh, could ultimately lead to war. Uh, and the decision then to go after Soleimani in the middle of this punch and counterpunch situation, uh, without question, raised the risk that we would be at war. And very frankly, having done that, the Iranians sent 12 missiles into our base, our airport uh, that we had in Iraq. And those missiles were aimed at US lives. We got enough advance notice so we could, you know, we were able to move those people into bunkers and protect their lives. But make no mistake about it, if that didn't happen, there would have been many US military that would have lost their lives. And if that had happened, we would be at war with Iran. So that, that is the fundamental difference, uh, which is when you make those kinds of decisions, you ought to damn well consider the risks of war. So all of this has happened. Now, what is the best path forward for the US? Well, look, the problem now with uh, Iran is we are we continue to be in a very tense situation with Iran. Uh, nothing has really changed in terms of the basic 
relationship or the failure of that relationship uh, that we have. Both sides tried to bully the other side, and they failed. Uh, the president tried to bully Iran by walking away from the nuclear accords. Uh, he basically abandoned the other allies that were part of that uh, accord. He then increased sanctions dramatically, increased our forces in the Middle East, and he thought this kind of maximum pressure approach would force Iran to the table. Didn't happen. And I would suspect that the intelligence people around the president basically said it ain't gonna happen. Iran, at the same time, also tried to bully the president to get the hell out of the Middle East. And they based it on, on the president's comments himself. I mean, uh, there's no secret that, you know, he, he's talked about isolationism, about America first, uh, that uh, he basically made the decision in Syria to abandon our forces, to move our forces out of Syria, abandon our allies. He basically said to the world, we're 7,000 miles away, let the countries there take care of their own problems. Uh, the Iranians uh, conducted uh, some sophisticated attacks on Saudi oil facilities. They conducted attacks on tankers in the Gulf. There was no response from the president to those attacks. And I think the Iranians made the decision that, you know, with a few other attacks, uh, this president will get so frustrated, he'll get, he'll get out of the Middle East. That didn't happen. So both sides in their own ways made fundamental mistakes uh, in judging the relationship and where it needed to go. We are now in the middle of that same situation. The president's ratcheting up sanctions again. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our allies uh, are beginning to take steps because Iran now has, uh, has said they're gonna proceed with nuclear enrichment in violation of those accords. Uh, and the situation is deteriorating badly and I think it could lead to a miscalculation. Look, there's only, there's only one way to try to resolve this issue. And that one way is, uh, is to try to get back to the negotiating table. And the best way to do that, it seems to me, is to get our allies, Great Britain, Germany, France, Russia, China, all involved in the original agreement, to come together to try to see if we can't, without conditions, sit and try to begin negotiations on the differences that are there. Iran, you know, the economy is collapsing. They are having problems. There are incentives on their part. The United States, uh, at the same time, uh, there are clearly are incentives on our part because of the danger of, of going to war and the miscalculation that could have us at war. So there is an incentive here for all sides to try to meet and negotiate. And, you know, there's no guarantees here. But that's what negotiations are all about, is to try to do that. So, you know, and I, okay, I, I saw Mike, Mike Pompeo the other day, and I said, for goodness sakes, try to pursue with our allies an effort to try to get back to negotiations. Otherwise, you're gonna be at war. So, you know, at least make that effort. And, you know, I, I think there are reasons for the parties to, to, take that, uh, to take that step. Because it is a tense situation. We have upped our presence in the, in the Gulf. We've added almost five to 7,000. Uh, and make no mistake about it, when that situation is as tense as it is, it is subject to miscalculation. An Iranian who's operating a missile site, you know, makes a mistake of judgment. That's what you saw happen with that plane. A mistake of judgment that could lead us into war, or a US military force you know, for, for some reason miscalculates what they're seeing happening uh, on the Iranian side of the Gulf. And they make a mistake. 
So we are now in a very tense situation. We came very close to going to war. And we remain close to going to war if we don't at least try to develop an off-ramp that allows for negotiations with parties. It's good to have your perspective. Um, I'd like to talk about leadership. You've uh, held a wide range of leadership roles during your career in the federal government. You were head of the US Office for Civil Rights in President Nixon's administration, a longtime member of Congress, the OMB director and White House chief of staff in President Clinton's administration, and as we just discussed, the head of CIA, but also the Secretary of Defense in President Obama's administration. So what was the hardest job you held? <laughs> and why? <laughs> well, they were all kinds of sons, sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> They're all tough challenges. Uh, and, you know, look, uh, I, I'm the son of Italian immigrants. My, my parents uh, said it was important to give back to the country because the country had given them so much. Uh, and uh, the result was that, uh, you know, I, I, I became, after getting out of law school and out of the military, decided that I would, uh, I would, go into politics and uh, got a job with uh, somebody, you know, there's a few people in this audience who still remember Senator Tom Keekel, uh, who uh, gave me a job as a legislative assistant in Washington. And, uh, you know, I, I, I learned early on uh, the critical importance of, uh, of leadership qualities. And our democracy depends a great deal on leadership, there are business people here. Uh, your businesses depend on leadership. Uh, I often tell the students at the Panetta Institute that in a democracy we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks involved with leadership, and make no mistake about it, if you're gonna be a leader, you're gonna have to take risks. I mean, the decision by President Obama to go after bin Laden was a risk. But he made that decision. Uh, there are tough decisions made uh, every day that involve risks. But if you're willing to do that, I think you can ultimately avoid crisis or certainly contain it. But if leadership is not there, if you're not willing to take the risks associated with leadership, you don't, want to, you don't want to get people angry, you don't want to raise their taxes, you don't want to cut their benefits, you don't want to do anything, then crisis will drive policy in this country. And the problem right now is that we are largely driven by crisis. And you can govern that way but there's a price to be paid, which is you lose the trust of the American people in our system of governing. Uh, and in many ways, that explained what happened in 2016. Uh, and it continues, it continues to be a problem as people are trying to search for the kind of leadership that can deal with these issues. But I, I worry about the inability and really the dysfunction in Washington, it's dysfunctional. Because both parties uh, are divided. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of partisanship involved. Uh, blame enough to go around for all sides. But the inability to sit down and to work together and to exercise the leadership and the risks uh, in order to try to solve the problems in this country the failure to do that, I think, undermines our democracy. It undermines our democracy. I mean, look, you know, I, I, I've often said I've seen Washington at its best and Washington at its worst. The good news is I've seen Washington work. You know, when I went back with Tom Keekle, uh, Tom Keekle was uh, obviously a moderate, uh, progressive Republican from California. That was the tradition in California at the time, coming out of uh, Hiram Johnson uh, and uh, Goody Knight and uh, 
Earl Warren. Uh, and uh, Kinkle was the minority whip in the Senate. He was working with Jacob Javits and Hugh Scott and Clifford Case and George Aiken and Mark Hatfield. They worked with Democrats on major issues. When I got elected to the Congress, Tip O'Neill was the speaker. Democrats, Democrat. But he had a great relationship with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader. Uh, they had their political differences, of course. Did they fight each other in elections, of course. But when it came to major issues, they worked together because they thought it was important for the country. And we were able to do things. I mean, even in the Reagan administration, we passed Social Security reform. God, it's the third rail of politics. We passed tax reform, bipartisan, on both. We passed budgets. We were able to get things done. That, that is democracy. That's, what's, that's how our democracy is supposed to function. And today, there's an inability to deal with major issues that face this country. We can't get immigration reform. Everybody knows it's broken. Everybody knows we need it. They can't do it. They can't do the kind of tax reform that should be done uh, for this country. They can't deal with the budget. I mean, my God. <laughs> you know, I, when I was budget chair, when I was OMB director, we eventually balanced the federal budget. Remember, balance the federal budget. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I mean, I honestly thought once we balance the budget, it's not going to be imbalanced because it'll be politically risky to, to, to do that. I mean, within a few years, we were back in deficits. Today, we're looking at a federal debt of $24 trillion and an annual deficit now exceeding a trillion dollars. In this administration, they have added over $5 trillion to the debt. And nobody cares. The Democrats don't want to deal with it. The Republicans don't want to deal with it. Nobody wants to face the challenges of how do you try to fiscally discipline the country again, and so they're borrowing. They don't want to deal with that. Healthcare, no willingness to work together on healthcare. So issue after issue is not being dealt with. And you're seeing it play out even in this impeachment process, that partisanship that begins to undermine what should be a serious effort to try to find the truth. And it's now playing out in this, you know, Democrat, Republican uh, trench warfare. So we're paying a price for this. And, you know, the one thing I, I keep telling the young people who come to our institute is, you can't get trapped by that. You've got to rise above it. It is about governing, for Christ's sakes. That's why you're elected. It's to govern the country. It's not to beat up the other side. It's to govern. And I know it's not easy. It's tough. Governing is a, is, for those of us who have been part of that process, it is tough. <laughs> I mean, I, just a, let me take a quick moment on, on, on one, one example. In the Clinton White House, we used to have a war room for everything. So every time there was an issue, we had to go into the war room and look at who was for us, who was against us, and, and work the votes. We, we had the budget up. And there was a Democratic con uh, Congresswoman who was listed as no. And so I went up to her, I was OMB director at the time, I said, what the hell's going on? You're, you're listed as no. And we need your vote. This is an important vote for the president. And she said, Leon, I just have some problems with it. And I said, look, I wish you'd think about this. This is really important. Went back to the White House, told the president. Next morning, I got a call from her. She said, come up, I want to meet with you. So I immediately went up and she said, uh, I need to talk to you. I said, what can I do for you? She said, last night, I had a dream. I said, okay. <laughs> what, the, what the hell was your dream? She said, I, I dreamt I talked to Jesus. I said, what did Jesus have to say? <laughs> so Jesus said that I really should support the president. Really should support him. 
if I get the casino I want in downtown Detroit. <laughs> Welcome to politics. <laughs> Welcome to governing. She got her casino, we got her vote. The budget passed by one vote. That's, that's what governing is all about. And it takes that kind of leadership to be able to get it done. That's, you know, that is our democracy. Somehow we've got to get back to that. We need to get back to that. Because frankly, we cannot be a dysfunctional democracy in which both sides can't govern in Washington and survive as a democracy. We can't. Thank you. Let's uh, turn our attention to the recent impeachment of the president and the Senate trial, which is um, now getting underway. And then maybe we can spend a little time talking about the presidential election, too. So based on your experiences with uh, working with US presidents and foreign leaders, um, can you help for us put, put this in perspective? And how do you see all of this playing out in the coming weeks? Uh, well, it is a reflection of our times and what we're going through. Uh, it begins with a, a president who doesn't abide by moral boundaries. And that's just his nature. I, I mean, look, I, that's who he is. Any of you that dealt with New York developers, it shouldn't come as a surprise. <laughs> that's the way they operate. Uh, and that's, that's the way he operates. He does, you know, it, it, it is about getting whatever the hell he wants uh, and not paying attention to the advisors that most presidents have who say, don't do it. Uh, and so, you know, from the very beginning, we've been enmeshed in this stuff, you know, going through the Mueller investigation, they didn't find evidence of collusion. They, they didn't uh, you know, uh, proceed uh, to, to, to recommend action, although on obstruction, it was pretty clear that they left that, that door open. But the reality is that the Mueller report would not have resulted in impeachment. The speaker made clear she wasn't interested in impeachment. And you would have thought that having gone through the Mueller investigation, gone through all of that crap, that the president would say, I'm not gonna mess around. He gets on the phone <laughs> with the president of the Ukraine and says, you know, do me a favor, I want you to investigate Joe Biden. You know, I, I'm sure people knew that he was crossing a line when he did that. And when he withholds aid, you know, to, uh, to, to get them to do a public announcement uh, that they would conduct an investigation, pretty clear cut. So one of the problems here is, is a president who keeps, who keeps crossing those lines and, 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 and doesn't play by the rules. And really, frankly, under the Constitution feels that under Article Two, whatever he does is okay. And at the same time, you've got now a Congress that is partisan, is divided, uh, and can't work together on an issue like this. Because if the facts that I just described are pretty clear, and I think they are, you would think that members would say, you know, we got a problem here. Republicans and Democrats, we got a problem. Let's look at this issue. Let's try to find the truth of what happened. And then, if if in fact the president abused his power, what action do we take? Do we impeach him? Do we censure him? We've got to do something to, make, to send a signal that this, this is the, behavior, the kind of behavior that our forefathers tried to protect against. That's the way it should work. But because of this partisan divide, the Republicans basically took the position, you know, the, the the president's position, which is that this was a perfect call, he did, he did nothing wrong. And so, you know, the House, on a partisan basis, votes to impeach. And now we're going to the Senate, uh, the Republican Party's in charge. 
and it would appear, you know, that uh, push comes to shove that the, uh, the party is not going to uh, vote to impeach the president. Now, we'll see. Uh, you know, I, I, am, I am somebody that, having been in Washington, having been in those moments where you suddenly have to sit back and think hard about the oath that you swear to protect and preserve and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that there are moments, no matter how political that place is, there are moments that demand that you rise to a higher place. And I'm hoping that when they sit down and when they start to go through the facts, that they'll understand that they've got, they've got some issues they're going to have to deal with. And I hope that they do it in a fair and impartial way. Because I think it's important to the country that even though we may all be political, everybody may be in our trenches, that we look and see that this process can operate uh, under our Constitution in a fair way. And I'll tell you if it doesn't, if, if the Senate tries to bypass the process, acquit, and get the hell out of town, then there is a danger that impeachment is going to become just another political tool to beat up the other person. And that, you know, if the Democrats get elected, if the Democratic president gets elected, make no mistake about it, the Republicans will try to play the same card. So it is very important for the country that the Senate take its time, go through the process, listen to the evidence, listen to the witnesses, because even though they may vote to acquit, by going through that process, they send a real signal to the future that no president should go through this damn process in the future. Okay. Thank you. So our PPIC survey came out this week. We found a record low 18% of Californians saying that the president and Congress can work together and accomplish a lot this year. I don't know any of those 18%, by the way. I haven't actually <laughs> met any of them. But I believe that that's what our survey says. Uh, we talk a lot, of, and you talk a lot, about the dysfunction in Washington. You, and today it came up. Challenges facing Washington today is politics having precedence over governing. Your son, Jimmy Panetta, is now a member of Congress representing the Monterey area. How do you advise him to do the hard work of governing in this climate? Well, you know, when, when Jimmy said he was, uh, he was, he was going to run for uh, my old office on the Central Coast, uh, Sylvia and I looked at each other and said, I guess we're going to have to go through this shit all over again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which we did, which we did. Uh, and uh, Jimmy, you know, uh, this is his second term. And, you know, the, the good thing is that uh, Jimmy saw, the, I mean, the times I'm talking about under Tip O'Neill, uh, uh, Jimmy was there, and he saw, you know, we, we went out to dinner with Republicans, we... Uh, went on trips with Republicans. We had a great relationship. We played basketball down uh, in the gym with uh, Democrats and Republicans playing together. It was a different situation. Uh, and he saw, he saw that work. And I, I think he knows you know, what uh, the problems that we see now uh, in Washington and really wants to, uh, wants to govern. He feels he was elected to govern. Uh, so what he's doing is uh, even as frustrating as it is to watch this thing at, at what goes on at a high level, that there is an effort by a, a, a group of new members being elected to the Congress who really do want to get back to governing and want to get back to uh, working together in a bipartisan way. There's something called the Solutions Caucus uh, in the freshmen, 24 Democrats, 24 Republicans. Uh, and their goal is to try to work across uh, and try to work together to see if they can develop a bipartisan approach to health care, to immigration, and other key issues. And it's tough. It's not easy. Leadership uh, is nervous about it. But ultimately, my hope is that when you begin to elect newer members that really do want to get back to governing, 
that ultimately this thing can change. I mean, I, you know, what I see in Jimmy is a sense of hope that we can get back to governing. Uh, this thing is not going to change from the top down. I wish it would. It, it should change from the top down, but it's not. It's only going to change from the bottom up as we elect people that are willing to uh, be able to get back to, to governing. Uh, I, think, I think it'll happen. I, re you know, I, I really believe that it will happen. But it's going to take time. And it's going to take risks. If a, if a new president gets elected and decides that it's important to govern, you know, mark my words, that president will probably be a one-term president. Because the likelihood is they're going to have to piss off their own party. That's the nature of governing. You know, when Bill Clinton did the budget, you know, we, we, I think we trimmed about $500 billion from the deficit. He made some very tough decisions. And I remember the president at one point said, you know, this assures that I'm a one-term president. Hmm. But he was willing to make that decision. And if you're willing to make the tough decisions, by the way, Bill Clinton got reelected. Because it, what he did helped build a strong economy for the country. And I think people who are willing to take those risks on tough decisions ultimately benefit from making those kinds of decisions. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, ultimately, as, as tough as it looks right now, that ultimately people will come together and uh, be able to understand that their primary responsibility is to govern this country. So that's what gives you hope. Or that's what gives you hope. That's what, that's, <laughs> that and a bunch of Hail Marys that I say. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question from the audience, and I want to make sure that we get, we get to some of the questions from the audience. And I hope that if others have turned in questions, bring them up here. Um, this is a little different from what else we're talking about, but certainly timely and relevant. Can you talk about your role as chair of the Pew Oceans Commission? Uh, yeah, you know, it, look, I, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's certainly not a mystery that climate change is having a hell of an impact uh, in terms of, uh, of not only our climate and our weather systems, but, but the ocean. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was in Congress, because I represented a coastal area uh, in California, uh, you know, the Monterey Bay, the Big Sur coastline, uh, I was very concerned about trying to protect uh, the quality of the ocean there because uh, it was critical. Critical not just to environmentalists, it was critical to the business community to try to make sure that we protected that coastline. Uh, and I, to this day, I think one of the proudest things I did in the Congress was to establish the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which protects that area off the coast for, uh, for the future. And, and by the way, pre uh, prevents offshore drilling. Uh, and, and that was part of the point, was to try to make sure that we could always protect it from that. Uh, when, I got out, when I got out and Pew, the Pew Commission asked me to chair this Oceans Commission, we were looking at a whole series of issues. We were looking at the problem of uh, increased pollution. We're looking at the problems of sustain, you know, fisheries that were being depleted and trying to sustain fisheries. We were looking at the loss of west wetlands and what that does to the fisheries uh, and to, to ocean life. We were looking at uh, development along the coastline because uh, you know, well over 50% of the American people, close to 60% of the American people, live along the coast in this country uh, and the impact that that was having. So we made recommendations to create a national uh, ocean uh, plan for, for the country, and we were able to get that done uh, thanks to, the, to uh, both Republican and Democratic administrations. Now I worry that as we focused on those other issues, there was a tsunami coming towards us called climate change. It has gotten worse. We have seen temperatures rise more dramatically. We have seen currents change. We've seen coral reef, we're, we're, we've seen 50% of the coral reefs being lost, and we expect that most of them will be lost in another 10 or 20 years. So this, it, this is extremely damaging. The acidic changes in the ocean are changing wildlife. They're killing wildlife. 
And it is absolutely essential that we try to address these issues. Uh, again, I think we have to have a, an honest debate about whether or not we want to pass on a viable planet to our children or whether we want to destroy life as we know it. That's, that's the issue. And you know, I hope, I hope this country wakes up. I hope the world wakes up because our oceans are a world problem. Uh, and recognize that we absolutely have to deal with protecting our oceans, which are the source of life itself. And thank you. Another question from our, uh, a member of our audience who says, can you please share some words of wisdom about how those who are early in their career, and I might add, and the rest of us too, um, can navigate these hyper, these hyper partisan times, in particular early career scientists who hope that science and facts still matter? Uh, there, a lot who know me, I, you know, I, I, I tell this story a lot because it, it, is, it makes a hell of a good point. Uh, I had a, a Jesuit priest at Santa Clara University who said, you know, God gave you life, but it's up to you to make a life. And he then told me a story that made the point of uh, the rabbi and the priest who decided they would get to know each other a little better. So one evening they went to a boxing match thinking if they went to events, they could talk to each other, talk about each other's faith, and uh, learn about uh, their, their different religions. And so uh, at the boxing match, just before the bell rang, one of the boxers made the sign of the cross. The rabbi nudged the priest and he said, what does that mean? The priest said it doesn't mean a damn thing if he can't fight. <laughs> now, what, what is essential now is the need for people to understand that they're gonna, if they, they've got to get involved in our democracy. They've got to be willing to fight for what they believe is right. Uh, and, and, and look, you know, I, I know it can be depressing. I know it can be, uh, you know, at times, uh, you know, just something you don't even want to get involved with. And, and politics has gotten worse in terms of money, in terms of the influences, in terms of special interests. It's gotten tougher. But it is our democracy. I mean, our forefathers, we talk a lot about the Constitution these days. It starts with we the people. We the people, in order to uh, create a more perfect union and promote justice and, and provide for the national defense, it's we the people. And that's why it's important for people to get involved, young people to get involved. Because mark my words, you can, the great satisfaction for those of us who've been in public policy, you know, it sure as hell isn't money. And it sure as hell isn't just the honor of being in the job, although, you know, that counts for something. It is the fact that you can do things to make people's lives better. You can get things done. And that's the great satisfaction of being involved in our democracy. If you can improve the lives of people, that is, frankly, what the American dream is all about. I used to ask my parents, why did you come to this country from all thousands of miles away you know, you didn't know where you were going. You had at least the comfort of home, even though it was a poor area in Italy. Why did you come all of that distance to a strange land? And, and I never forgot what my father said. He said, because your mother and I believed we could give our children a better life. That is the American dream, giving people a better life. It's what public service is all about. But to get it done, you got to roll up your sleeves and you got to jump in and you got to fight. And if you do that, our democracy will work because our forefathers knew that it was a process of everyone exchanging ideas, of everyone kind of fighting for what they believe is right, but ultimately everyone believing that in that battle you try to find consensus and you try to solve problems. That is what 
has saved our democracy for over 200 years. And it will do it again. Why? Because I really think the great strength of this country doesn't lie in Washington, it lies in the American people. It lies in people like you, you know, who through your common sense and spirit and kind of understanding of what's right and what's wrong, that you are the strength of what makes our democracy what it is. And that's, I guess, what gives me hope for the future. I know you have a lot of confidence in the voters, and we've, we've, we've talked about that, and the voters will be making some big choices um, later on um, in the year, well, in March in California in the primary. Um, let's uh, make sure that we're in Sacramento, and we're talking to a Sacramento audience that we at least spend um, a moment here um, talking about how state government is functioning in California from your perspective. Um, Democrats control the governor's office, all the constitutional office, two-thirds majorities in the state senate and assembly. How are things going in California today? Well, you know, look, I, I was uh, born and raised in California, born in Monterey. Uh, have, uh, have loved this state and continue to love this state. Uh, I think it's a great state. Uh, great state because of our diversity, because we are people from every part of the world that has come here uh, and, uh, and, and made our home here. My parents did it. Uh, diversity in terms of our economy. Uh, we have a great economy because it is diverse. Whether it's agriculture, whether it's high tech, whether it's entertainment, whether it's tourism, we've got some great diversity within our, uh, our economy. And it's also great because of uh, you know, the opportunity that is given to everybody to succeed. And I think if you, know, you live in California, no matter where you come from, you've got a damn good chance of trying to be able to succeed in life, and that's important. Uh, I, look, I, I worry about three things in California. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the, the politics in California, even though I, as a Democrat, you know, nice to be in California, um, but I worry that we begin to lose the balance that you need in a political process. And, you know, for the life of me, when I, again, when I first got elected to Congress, uh, and, uh, you know, California legislature, Republicans and Democrats were working together. Moderate Republicans were working with Democrats to help govern this country. And what that produces is, you know, it, it doesn't mean that legislation doesn't happen. What it means is that it's better legislation because it takes into consideration all sides of an issue. I mean, if you, if you, if you just walk in and, and have one, you know, one-sided view on the issue, you're going to do it without reaching out and understanding all the consequences. So having that kind of, of relationship is important in terms of governing in the state. And, and look, I, you know, the Republicans have made some terrible mistakes uh, in the positions they've taken. They've isolated themselves from you know, where, where most California should be. You know, it, it's about time they understand that, you know, if they want to they stay in any kind of political positions, they're going to have to, they're going to have to look at immigration. They're going to have to look at issues of inequality in our society. They're going to have to look at climate change. They're going to have to make some changes. But, but I really think it's important that at some point there be a better balance so that both parties are working together rather than just having one party that basically says, screw you, we're going to do it, are we? I mean, so somehow we need to get back to that. Secondly, the economy in the state. I worry that, you know, while it's a strong economy, I think that if we're looking at some kind of uh, slowdown in the economy or some kind of recession, number one, it's going to impact on our state economy, our state budget, uh, and put us back into a hole. Number two, I do worry about uh, the inequity within California. I want everybody to have a job. I want everybody to be able to move forward and succeed. I want to make sure that everyone 
uh, has that, uh, that opportunity. And I think that the only way we can do that is to get the business community and government to understand that there's got to be a partnership in order to make that happen. It can't just be good guys, bad guys. It's got to be everybody working together. And thirdly, education. Education is absolutely critical to the future of California. We need kids to get a college education. We need to give them the skills that they're going to need in the 21st century. That is the key to the future. And unfortunately, you know, we have a great higher ed system, but there hasn't been a new plan for higher ed, you know, since the Brown administration. It's time to look at our higher education institutions, whether it's CU or CSU or community colleges. We got to figure out a way to make sure we can get all of our students to be able to get a good education and to be able to move forward. And so education is the other issue that I worry about in terms of the ability to make, make that dream come Thank through. you. I can't believe it, but the hour has gone by so fast, as it, as it always does when you and I get together um, and, and talk. I want to thank you, uh, Secretary Leon Panetta and Ambassador Gaddy Vasquez, for being part of our program today and for being part of PPIC. And um, your work, both of you, and, and um, all of you being here uh, give, gives us hope for the future. And thank you. I want to thank our generous sponsors for their support that made this lunch possible today. And I want to thank our audience and our event team and our catering staff for their hard work today in putting together this program and, um, and all, all of you um, uh, 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 um, in the audience today. Thank you again. We hope to see you on February 3rd because that will be our next program which will be on the 2020 census. Yes, we have a 2020 election, but we also have a 2020 census. And we don't want people to forget about that because counting, uh, counting people in California is gonna be very important. So that will be our next program. Great. Secretary Panetta, Ambassador Vasquez, everybody uh, who's come here today, have a wonderful afternoon. Drive safely home. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>